as increasing numbers of OPP officers were assigned to Ottawa, it meant we had to have lodging, we had to provide food, we had to provide vehicles, we had to provide radios, we had to ensure appropriate shift schedule, we had to ensure that those officers were backfilled in their home locations. Uh, every officer that we deployed to Ottawa or elsewhere around this province, uh, for example, January uh, on, uh, on the 12th of February, there were 20 simultaneous events that we were responding to. That means a OPP officer out of a community for which I have policing responsibility for. So that takes a significant amount of coordination and cooperation. So Superintendent Abrams was working very closely with our emergency operations center, our emergency management unit to make sure that all of those provisions were in place. And then also he would have had an entire command structure that he would have been managing to facilitate the deployment of OPP officers well in Ottawa. Okay, um, and I wanna pull up an email now, which I think you referred to previously. It's OPP 401576. Um, and this is a request from Chief Slowly on February 2nd for, uh, for some additional assistance. If we go down to the bottom. Chief Slowly, so if we, just, sorry, if we go back up, I'm seeking your assistance in providing resources to assist the Ottawa police with our operational plan. And so are you aware of whether at, at this point, February 2nd, um, anybody, and I appreciate it wasn't necessarily you, but anybody uh, on the ground, Superintendent Abrams, had seen a copy of the operational plan? Uh, I'm not aware you would have to ask them that question directly. Okay. Um, and there's a series of uh, requests there. Were those, were those requests fulfilled? To my knowledge, all of those requests were fulfilled. Okay. Do you know how long it took to get the uh, PLT, the 50 to 60 uniform officers there? We had PLT uh, there, I believe. We saw an influx of uh, PLT between the 2nd and the 4th of February. Um, Inspector Baudouin, who appeared before the commission yesterday, would be able to provide you the specifics of that. I know he himself, at my request, uh, attended Ottawa on or about the 4th of February. So it would be best to speak with those that were responsible for these assets to be able to get the timing of exactly when they were there. Uh, but many of these assets were already on ground in Ottawa, ready and able to assist at this time. Okay. Um, why did you ask uh, the inspector to, to attend Ottawa? Uh, it had been relayed to me that uh, PLT was not necessarily being utilized to its fullest extent. And I felt that, uh, that Inspector Baudouin could provide Chief Slowly and his command team with some uh, experience and, and guidance as it relates to Marcel's expertise and wanted to ensure that the chief had the availability of that subject matter expertise. Okay. And through this kind of first weekend and up to about February 2nd, how, how often had you been briefing uh, the Deputy Solicitor General? That would vary on the day, at a minimum, at least once a day. Okay, and were those, I mean, we've got your, your, your sort of text message exchanges, yes. um, which, are, which, which do brief the, the Deputy Solicitor General. Uh, would you also have daily phone calls? Not necessarily daily phone calls. If something came up, there was a question about something, or um, there was something that, uh, that went beyond what had been, had been reported, uh, we may connect by phone, but there were not scheduled daily phone calls, no. Okay. Um, now, I understand from uh, Deputy Solicitor General Di Tommaso's witness summary that uh, you and he spoke on February 3rd. Do you recall that conversation? Uh, not specifically without uh, referring to any materials that you may be able to provide to me. Okay. Um, well, I'll, we don't need to sort of pull it up, but his witness summary uh, relays that you first told him about the possibility of a blockade uh, of the Ambassador Bridge on that day. Does that sound roughly accurate? Uh, that's fair. That's fair. I can't say for certain that it was uh, on that day. Um, 
I have disclosed all of my situational updates to the Deputy Solicitor General uh, to the Commission, so it may be contained in there. There was also the Hendon reports that were going to the Provincial Operational uh, Security Advisor, uh, but I can't say for certain that it was on that date during that phone call that I would have provided that information. Okay. Um, and the first time that you re relayed that information to uh, the Deputy Solicitor, whether it was on the, the third or, or otherwise, uh, were there any concerns raised in response to uh, what impact that might have? Any concerns raised by me or by him? By, by the Deputy Solicitor General. We certainly at some point had a conversation about the potential of a, a protest in Windsor specific to the Ambassador Bridge. And I had shared with him that we had offered our assistance to Windsor. Okay. Um, and we will I'll sort of deal with Windsor uh, as a sort of separate subject, so I want to yes. keep the focus on, on Ottawa for the moment. Um, if we could go to OPP 404580, uh, this in page 47, these are your, this is your text exchange with the, the Deputy Solicitor General. There it is. Good morning, Deputy. Uh, no events reported overnight. I'm sorry, the date on this is, uh, is February 4th. I spoke with Commissioner Lucky, Chief Slowly, and Chief Raymer last night. All have access to the necessary OPP resources. Uh, we will be continuing to assist OPS and TPS with their requirements today and throughout the weekend. And the Deputy says, thanks, uh, Commissioner Creek. Much appreciated. Can you Tell us about that discussion uh, with Chief Raymer, Chief Slowly, and Commissioner Lucky the previous evening. Yes, and that was, uh, as I recall, it was not a discussion with them all collectively. I had spoke to, uh, to all of them throughout the day. We had numerous events that were transpiring, and in particular, there was a planned event to take place in Toronto on Saturday, February the 5th. So we were doing our best to coordinate access to the necessary resources and provide the necessary resport, supports to the competing and concurrent events that were taking place around the province. So I was giving the deputy some assurance uh, that we were lending that necessary support and we were fulfilling any requirements that had been asked of us. Okay. Um, and what resources were deployed to Ottawa and Toronto that second weekend of the protests? So there was ample resources. Uh, there was frontline resources provided. There was intelligence resources provided. Um, I don't believe at the end of the day we ended up providing any public order assets to Toronto, um, but that evidence would best come from the hubs that we established. Uh, we, had a hub, we had hubs that were ensuring that the public order teams uh, were deployed where they needed to be, when they needed to be, which could mean any one of the 10 public order units would have been deployed to any one of these locations. So that level of detail would have to be shared with you from the, uh, the hub. Um, and based on what you were hearing from Superintendent Abrams, who is the strategic uh, superintendent on the ground, what, you know, did it seem that everything was under control at that point on the, the 4th? So I'm not in direct contact with Superintendent Abrams. Um, my information is coming at this point in time from situational reps that are coming, uh, reports, sorry, that are coming multiple times a day, which is providing me with a level of situational awareness in terms of the number of vehicles, the number of protesters, uh, any reports of, of criminal activity. Okay. Um, I want to, so Deputy Solicitor General Di Tommaso, again, in his, uh, his summary, told us that he spoke with the Toronto Police Service Chief Raymer uh, on February 3rd, which is the Thursday before this, and um, who explained to uh, Deputy Solicitor General that TPS needed additional resources. Uh, and uh, DSG Di Tommaso told him um, that Chief Raymer, or sorry, told, told Commission Council that Chief Raymer said, the OPP doesn't have resources for us, essentially. 
Um, is, is that accurate, that there weren't actually OPP resources to be directed towards Ottawa? So, or, so Toronto? first, I can't say whether uh, Chief Raymer's um, conversation with the deputy was accurate based on what they knew at the time. Deputy D. Tommaso did inquire with me, being under the understanding that Toronto Police had asked for OPP resources and they were not available. I directly inquired with Toronto Police and we sorted that miscommunication out. Uh, there were OPP resources available. We were already integrated into their command centre. We had a presence in their command centre through intelligence, our highway safety division. Uh, so we were providing resources to Toronto Police. Okay. Um, and so it's not accurate then that, uh, that there weren't OPP resources available, that they did get sent that weekend? There were OPP uh, assets and resources available, and they were sent that weekend, yes. Okay. And this weekend of the 5th to the 6th, was the potential blockade of the Ambassador Bridge factored into resource allocations in any way? We had made a number of inquiries with Windsor Police offering assistance and, and resources, um, and we were advised that that assistance was not required. Um, if it was required that uh, a request would be made. The chief of Windsor seemed confident that they were able to handle the anticipated activities uh, with the resources they had available to them. Okay. Um, I want to take you now to OPP 401507, which is a foreword of an email uh, that Chief slowly sent to a number of people on his team the morning of February 5th. I'll just, uh, if we can scroll down, I'll let you review it, see if you recall seeing this email. It kind of, it went up through a number of OPP individuals, but if we go down to the main email from Chief Slowly, there it is. Um, it was directed to Deputy Chief Patricia Ferguson, and there are a number of individuals copied on it. Do, sorry, sorry, what are you drawing my attention? I just do you recall receiving this email as a as a foreword? Uh, not without having had the opportunity to read the entire string. I can only see a small portion uh, of the email, so I would have to ask your indulgence to be able to review sure. the entire thing. No, if we can just scroll down, we'll let you review it quickly. It would be most helpful if you went to the, the top of the string. Okay, where, where you received it, you mean? Yes. Okay, sure. Um, there, you've, you've received it from Deputy Commissioner Rose DeMarco, uh, and you said okay, thanks, please, Rose. Uh, please, if you don't mind stopping there, I'd like to, can you go back up? Okay, thank you. Stop, stop there, please. This is the, the part that has uh, my response. Sorry, can you bring it down? Thank you. Thank you. Keep going if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Please keep going. Please keep going. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I, uh, I do recall this you recall email. Thank you okay. for your indulgence <laughs> while okay. I familiarized myself with it. That's all right. Um, and so you received this email that morning, and I understand that you actually spoke with Chief Slowly later that day. Is that correct? Yes, yes. I believe I did speak to Chief Slowly uh, later that day to, uh, to relay uh, concerns over um, moving forward with, uh, with positive action as it related to, uh, to public order that had been relayed to me. Okay. And what were your concerns? Uh, concerns were around... Uh, not having a sufficient plan in place uh, as it was relayed by, uh, by my team. 
So whether a plan was in place and had not been clearly communicated um, and not having fully exhausted the, uh, the opportunities through, through PLT. Okay, and what was uh, the response to your concerns as expressed on that call? Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, he thanked me for, uh, for sharing it with him and he was, uh, he was going to review those concerns and, and next steps. Okay. Um, now, did you raise those concerns with the Deputy Solicitor General? No, I would not have raised those concerns with the Deputy Solicitor General. Okay. So by this point, uh, we're at sort of February 5th, you hadn't relayed to the Deputy Solicitor General that, uh, you know, any concerns about what was transpiring in Ottawa, whether the OPS had control of the situation. So I had had numerous conversations with the Deputy Solicitor General. All right, we are and listening this morning to the OPP him, Commissioner um, testifying at the forward, inquiry into the use of the Emergencies Act so last February in Ottawa. With me is Michael Kempa. He's an Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of Ottawa. He's been listening in. Michael, good morning. Good to see you. The OPP Commissioner has been testifying this morning. What do you make of his testimony so far? So far, we're seeing that although there seems to have been good intelligence within the OPP, one way or another, it did not make its way through the chain uh, at the Ottawa Police Service. There was a level of confusion between those two agencies about what the nature of the protest would likely be, with the Ottawa Police Service clearly underestimating the length of time that the protest or occupation planned to stay, with no exit strategy, as we keep hearing over and over again from members of the OPP giving evidence. It says to me that more than anything, the quality of sharing information is certainly as important as the content of information itself. Superintendent Robert Bernier contradicted his statement yesterday, his initial statement, by concluding he did not feel the act was needed. Why do you think he altered his view? And Michael, are we getting a clear answer as to whether or not the OPP felt calling the Emergencies Act into play was necessary? No, not yet. And that's simply for the reason that Commissioner Karik himself, who is now testifying, said in March that it absolutely was necessary and there was a threat to national security. So far, his own people, head of intelligence, head of operations or coordination with Ottawa police, have said potential threat to national security. So we've got to clear that up today, and I'm sure we will. The other issue with uh, Mr. Bernier at Ottawa Police Service is although he said in his opinion they probably could have resolved matters without the Emergencies Act, the act was itself still helpful. He was surprised to learn while on the stand that what he believed to be tow trucks that were mobilized without the act had in fact been mobilized because of the act. So we're not sure what that will add up to. Helpful does not, necessar does not mean necessary. And that, of course, is the bar for the invocation of the Emergencies Act. I would say that up to today, we are only approaching that bar. We have not yet crossed it. Critically, we need to learn more about what happened between 11th and 14th February. If there were developments that perhaps the heads of police on the ground were not aware of, that the federal government learned about, maybe through the RCMP, maybe through top levels of the OPP, maybe through CSIS, then the act will have been justified. We're going to learn a lot over the next few days. Yeah, you just mentioned CSIS, and I want to ask you about that before we need to wrap up. Um, the justice has said that he will meet with them behind closed doors. This is based on a request from the federal government. Tell us more about the role of CSIS in this and why this secret or how this secret testimony may impact the integrity of the inquiry. So the principle for holding information back from the public must always be that it is in the public interest and not in the government interest, nor in the interest of any particular agency to hold it back. If CSIS has information about the operation of certain radical groups across Canada. If those radical groups are not aware that CSIS has been watching them or watching them as effectively as they had, it would then be in the public interest to hold that information back. Justice Rouleau 
will essentially be the arbiter. It'll be he who will decide whether or not that information holding back is truly in the public interest or simply in the government interest. That's why we have a judge at the head of the commission. Michael Kempa, he's an associate professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa. Thank you so much.